Welcome to Talking Hoosier Baseball. We are recording this on Wednesday, January 24th, 2023. I am Carl James, joined by Chris Feeney and Cassidy Palmer. It is just over three weeks away from college baseball's opening day. This Indiana team may have the highest expectations of any Hoosier baseball club since the days of Joey Donato and Kyle Schwerber. We're going to take a big picture look at the national scene and how the Hoosiers fit into that. Indiana has already had some preseason accolades. We will touch a bit on what we saw in fall ball and how the Hoosiers fared over the last summer. What we won't do is dive deep into the spring roster as we'll get much better picture over the next couple of weeks as we talk to the coaching staff and make some observations in practice. Uh, we will have at least one more podcast before February, ever, February 16th to cover all of that. So stay tuned. Uh, we will get you that information. So to start with, uh, last time we had a, a really thorough pod was in the summer. Um, and the Hoosiers uh, were all over the place for, for summer ball. And Chris will get us started with the 2023 Summer League recap and accolades. All right, Carl. Thanks. And it is good to be back doing this. It has been quite a while, like you said. Um, like the last time really was in the summer. And we might have touched on a few of the uh, accolades and the awards and how guys were hot, you know, where they were playing. But to go over really the all-stars and the guys who really shined in their summer league, uh, you got to first go with Tyler Cerny, right? He was coming off of a uh, home run chain belt, right? And he went right out there to the summer league and he shined in the Appalachian League. He made the all-league team. He hit 336 with five bombs, played a great defense. Uh, you know, from what I read, the coaches really liked his attitude on the field. He was a leader. And this is a freshman, right? This is a freshman who, you know, didn't hit a high school, you know, go from high school to college. You got to hit that wall. He never did. And then he's going to play another, what, 25 games in the summer. You know, the life of a D1 player is is not uh, an easy one. But he, he shined there. And, and the coaches, staff, and the guys in that league really spoke well about him. And so did some national media. You know, he was one of the guys they mentioned, okay, here are some guys who played real well that didn't go to the Cape, you know, because usually everybody's eyes are on the Cape. Uh, Devin Taylor, rookie of the year in the New England League. Hit 314, hit eight bombs, showed off his speed, showed off his arm, showed off his baseball smarts. And not to beat a dead horse, but his coaches talk great about him too. Um, you know, maybe you'd think they came from the same program. But, again, same deal. He didn't hit a wall either. Uh, we had a couple guys headed out to the Cape. Again, these D1 athletes could take the summer off. They could hang out with their friends. They can relax. What do they do? Three days after a devastating loss out in Kentucky, they go out and they go play more ball. Brock Tibbetts, all-star. Okay. He had 289, 15 walks, 35 hits. He continued to get on base. He just continued to do what he did for us. Carter Matheson, all-star. He had 260, 23 walks, 35 hits. Uh, he played a lot in the outfield, from what I understand. A lot of center field, uh, it looked like, too. So, you know, that expanded something there. And then uh, a new addition to the team, Nick Mitchell, who, if you went out to fall ball at all, you, you noticed him. Uh, he's an outfielder that came over from Western Kentucky. He was a Cape Cod League All-Star as well. And the national media really raved about him, his performance out there uh, on the Cape. A couple other names, like two more performances we just wanted to really mention. Not that we don't expect it from Connor Foley to throw gas and strike dudes out, but 10 innings, 16 Ks, they didn't get to see too much of him because he strikes everybody out. It was kind of like fall ball. We didn't get to see too much of Connor Foley either. He would face three, four batters, and you know he'd be back in the dugout. And finally, Ty Bothwell. He went 4-1 uh, with a 2-3-6 ERA for the summer, and I believe he had a 10-strikeout game. So Ty just continued being tied through the summer. And it really is a commitment that these guys make. I believe it was Kyle Hart uh, we had on years ago. And he said, when you play D1 baseball, there's three things, right, you're going to do. You're going to hit the books, you're going to play baseball, and you're going to socialize. But then you realize when you get there, you can only do two out of three. And, you know, these guys have to make decisions. And, and most of the time, it's the books and the baseball, and that's it. So it really is something to – give them credit for you know, whether they do well or not in the summer leagues, but our guys just shined all over the place. So it makes it even better. All right. Uh, now we've got Cass who's going to uh, give a rundown on what we've seen so far from the national media on Indiana's preseason accolades. 
Thank you, Carl. Uh, so looking at the preseason accolades so far, there, there are likely still more to come. Uh, I'm betting D1 will have some more, uh, more stuff coming out, uh, possibly 11.7. There's a few who, who haven't uh, released a ton yet. Um, but starting off uh, kind of team-wide, uh, we've had a few publications uh, put IU either just at the end of the rankings or just outside of the rankings uh, for top 25 to start the season. Uh, College Baseball Central uh, has IU placed the highest of any uh, any of the rankings so far, putting them at number 25 nationally. Uh, they also picked IU to finish second in the Big Ten. And uh, managing editor Noah Darling uh, called IU the most underrated team in America heading into 2024. Those are all great things to hear. Um, uh, out of D1, they have done their rankings and they have IU... Uh, in their top 25 consideration, the kind of next 15 teams. Uh, and Perfect Game has IU as 27th, uh, so the second team out of the top 25. And that's that's really good to see coming into the season. We haven't seen that, seen rankings or just out of the rankings in a little while preseason. So it's good to see that. Uh, and then another kind of larger group uh, accolade, uh, D1 has labeled IU's incoming freshman class as number 20 overall. Uh, we love seeing that with the new guys coming in. On the individual level, uh, I'll, I'll start off with uh, Devin Taylor. He is raking in all of the preseason accolades. Uh, Perfect Game has named him preseason Big Ten Player of the Year. Uh, obviously, then on the All Big Ten team, uh, they've also named him uh, to the preseason Second Team All American, uh, which I believe is the first time that's happened since Grant Richardson in 2021. That's that is a good player to be compared to we do like to see that uh he was also named the name number seven in this year's sophomore class and he was slotted at eighth on perfect games uh 2025 mlb draft board so not quite yet don't have to worry about that one this upcoming <laughs> for this year uh with some other guys uh there were a trio uh, of juniors who joined Devin on that uh, perfect game all Big Ten team. Uh, you've got Carter Matheson, who perfect game also named the number 51 player in the junior class. Uh, you've got Brock Tibbetts, who was listed as number 59 overall in the junior class. And you have Josh Pine. Uh, those three joined him there. And while he's not Playing next year, uh, Luke Sennard was uh, was named by Perfect Game as the number 52 uh, in the junior class. So I wanted to give that shout out here. Uh, Perfect Game also named uh, Morgan Colopy, number 26 overall in the senior class. And then among the freshmen, uh, Andrew Wiggins ranked number seven in the class. And Cal Sefcik was named 68th in the freshman class. Uh, with the transfers, uh, D1 Baseball did the did an impact transfers list where uh, Nick Mitchell, coming our way from Western Illinois, was named the number 31 impact transfer. And Ben Grable out of Northwestern uh, was named the 125th impact tra transfer. So we've got got some accolades both all over the field and all up and down the roster in the different classes, uh, which is how this team ends up in or just out of the rankings to start the season. Uh, so, Carl, uh, you're going to take us through the 
2024 schedule and looking at its strength. Yes. So um, as is pretty typical, uh, the Hoosiers have put together a uh, pretty nice and uh, competitive, uh, strong schedule for the for the 2024 season as they have in most years. Um, when I ran all of my numbers, it came in just a, a, a tad lighter than last season's schedule. Um, and again, that's based on last season's performance. If, if as a whole, these teams perform better than they did last year, then it may turn out to be as strong or possibly even stronger a schedule. But when you have this many teams, that usually kind of factors itself out. Um, uh, and boy, it gets hot right from the beginning. A pair of top 25 teams uh, Friday and Saturday uh, at Myrtle Beach uh, with Duke. And it's especially going to be tough as uh, the, the, the real strength of Duke is in their Friday night starter. So uh, the, the Friday morning game <laughs> facing their Friday starter uh, will be an, a very interesting town challenge for the Hoosiers. Um, and then they do play the host, Coastal Carolina, uh, on Saturday. Um, and then they wrap up that with, a, uh, with another NCAA tournament team, George Mason. Um, the more interesting kind of diversion from this is the second weekend when Indiana travels to Baylor. Uh, Baylor had an awful year last year. Um, they finished in the last half of the RPI. Um, so that's actually a an early season series that the Hoosiers will be expected to win. That will be a, a win expected. I've tried to pull up information on Baylor, um, and they're so far off the radar, no one's really even covering them. So I don't have details, but I think that th that just kind of comes to the expectation that they're not expected to have much in the way of expectations. Um, but then things heat up again <laughs> with uh, with the with uh, in Frisco, Texas, another tournament that'll include Alabama, Dallas Baptist, and Arizona. Um, you've got your spattering of uh, your mostly your typical, not including Kentucky uh, midweeks that are going to take place throughout the season. Um, no the... more Kentucky on the schedule, Carl? Huh? <laughs> no. Nope. Heard about that? I might have heard about that. There, 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 there was some discussion along those lines. <laughs> hey, we've got Northern Kentucky. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Oh, and Carl, before we move on to the rest of the schedule, yes. something I noticed, because it really should have probably came in uh, when Cass was talking about the accolades and the national attention. Not that I promote gambling. Not that I would do that in any way. But if you look on DraftKings in the futures, you know, mm -hmm. department, you have your regulars, Wake Forest at plus 700, LSU plus 750. And this is you to know, win the College World Series, correct? To win the whole show. Yeah. To win the yeah. whole thing. All right. Florida plus uh, 900. These are all seen. These are all SEC teams, right? The first non SEC team that comes up is TCU. They're still not in the SEC, are they? I mean, maybe they are. No, they're in the, uh, they're in the Big 12. Okay. Just making sure. I, I thought so. So yep. plus 2,000. So plus two thousand, the first Big Ten team. Who do you think it would be? It's obvious, I think. Iowa. What's the Iowa at, at plus eight thousand? Okay, so that's still you know. And if you if you know that Iowa is at plus eight thousand, where do you think IU is to win the whole show? If Iowa is plus eight thousand. I I think I think see, I think I saw this. I thought it was plus fifteen thousand. Correct. Yes. Plus okay. 15,000. For this program to be sitting where they're sitting on a list in Vegas like this, mm -hmm. I mean, guess who we're tied with? Mississippi State. Yeah. Plus 15,000. <laughs> yeah. You know, Maryland plus 20,000. Nebraska plus 30,000. Ohio State plus 90,000. So, I mean, it's not like a made up thing. It's not like, you know, oh, we're talking about them this down the third. You know, they're in the upper half to win the whole damn thing. Yep. And and I, I've never seen them this high up. I may have lost a few dollars in the past on a futures wager. It's certainly never paid this little, by the way. <laughs> Just in case. No, it usually pays. It would pay, you know, 90000 Uh So if anybody's wondering, 
You could put down uh, who's on ten dollar bill Hamilton. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Put down uh, Hamilton, and you could pay back one thousand five hundred and ten dollars if we win the whole thing. <laughs> so, and I we joke about it. It's gambling. It's fun, you know. But to me, if you just look at where we are being put now in the national eye, and it, it really is something different. Another thing, Cass. Sorry, Carl, jumping in on your thing here, but uh, another thing where Cass mentioned how we had Wiggins, I believe, was the number seven new freshman, and Taylor was the number seven new sophomore. When you look at those top ten lists, we're the only Big Ten, we're the only non like SEC, ACC team on either one of those lists. It, it, it was incredible. I remember when those photos came out. Yeah, you know, it was all A and M, Arkansas. Uh, you know, Georgia Tech and Indiana number seven or Indiana number eight, whichever one we were with, with Devin and with Andrew Wiggins. So nationally, it really is changing. And to just bring it back to where Carl is now, I'm sure the scheduling has a lot to do with it because we're getting more exposure. We're playing better teams. And and Coach Mercy don't give a damn who he plays early because it gets <laughs> us ready for later. Yep. Yep. Thank Sorry, you, Carl. No, that's fine. <laughs> The next series, this is the one I that I circled the moment I saw the schedule come out. Um, and it is when Troy comes to the BART. And that's going to be March 8th, 9th, and 10th. Um, Troy uh, was had an excellent year last year and are predicted to be even better. Um, I don't think they're making top 25 lists, but they're being considered. Um, and if anybody remembers in the, in the tough... Uh, 22 campaign, Indiana went to Troy and got swept. So this is a chance for a little bit of payback there. <laughs> Do you know if they've had any grounds work done? <laughs> if I remember, the the grounds weren't too too good there. Yeah. A lot of bad hops, well, like a, a dirty but field. This is, but this is going to be at the BART, so. Oh, so, so, uh, so, so they might get to experience some actual cold. <laughs> uh, and a real field. In early March. Yeah. Yep. Okay, but saying, I I really had like that because that's not only uh, a good series, but that's a good series that the Indiana fans will get to see in person. Yep. So yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's why I, I I've circled that one. That's that's going to be a really fun home series when uh, when Troy comes to town. And what's the date to that one, Carl? I don't have it. Uh, March eighth, uh, ninth, and tenth. <sighs> All right. There's a shot. There's a shot at fifty degrees. <laughs> right. I that's still going to be cold for him. Yep. Yep. Um, and then, uh, so the midweek over spring break is a trip to Nashville, Tennessee, to take on oh. Vanderbilt. Uh, so that's a huge, challenging uh, midweek matchup that'll be very interesting to uh, to take in. Um, then uh, Belmont has been decent. They're going to be another uh, non-con series. Um, we've got. Illinois to open will open up at the BART for the beginning of Big Ten play. That'll be the weekend of March twenty second. So Belmont's like our Big Ten buy, or or is that's the uh, that's just another no. Non-con? That's that's right before that's the end of non con. The Big Ten buy is the second week of Big Ten, and that mm-hmm. will be Butler, which is going to be Ouch. a Thursday through Saturday. So that's a Easter weekend, Thursday through Saturday, but it will be Sunday. four games. Because um, you just said that like it was a good thing. Butler, what? wouldn't we rather play them less times? <laughs> well, yes, I I, I yeah. agree. I'm just saying we are playing them four times. So. Oh, okay, no, but you were like saying it like yes, we're playing them four times. <laughs> no, I'm just I was just confirming that that even though it's Thursday through Saturday, it's going to be a four game four series games. because Saturday will be a dub is scheduled to be a double header. Um, no Easter Sunday game this year. Yeah, Butler is the single weakest team based on last year's results on this schedule. So the yeah, so really outside bad. of that weekend, we all want to be Butler fans. We want Butler to win yes. a lot more games this year than they did last year. I think they won nine games last year. So uh, oh. that was not pleasant. Uh, uh, then, uh, then a big opportunity to go out to College Park. And be the team to end Maryland's ridiculous winning series, Big Ten series streak that I keep hearing about, that I'm tired of hearing about, that somebody needs to put an end to. And that is when it needs to happen. April 5th, 
sorry, April 5th through 7th. Uh, it will happen. Go in and... It will happen then, Carl. Do you know why? <laughs> Guess what's April 8th? I don't know what's April 8th. The entire world will be converging on Bloomington. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Right. For the yes. solar eclipse to celebrate yes. us beating yes. Maryland. Yes. I, I really hope, honestly, I would joke that it's the eclipse the next day, but I really hope we have like contingency plan to get back from Maryland. There's going to be so <laughs> many people coming here yeah. that day. Yeah. I had that and a few years ago. We're going to be coming ago. from Maryland. I, I had that a few years ago in mid Missouri. So I, I, I can say for sure, like, be prepared for people to come. Maybe we, they should get a helicopter. Day off. <laughs> No, but we they got to travel from Maryland on Sunday, right? Yep. Right. yep. To They're the place everybody's right. traveling from everywhere. Yes. To 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 Central Indiana. Yep. Yes. Not even Central Indiana, bro. It's they were saying. Like I know. The, it's a hope. Yeah. You guys right, have like yeah. a four full minute, four full four minutes plus in blue. Oh, I was deep diving this the other day because I'm like, wait a second. Could the Bart sell tickets? Could we sit on the field? Is it like that? Is, is the Bart <laughs> facing the right way? <laughs> Apparently, the best view is this uh, putt putt in Ellettsville. <laughs> I don't know. That's what people yeah. are saying. Yep. But I don't know. Either way, that's a hell of a celebration with everybody coming to Boomer to celebrate beating Maryland. Yes. Be great. <laughs> Didn't see that one coming, did you, Carl? No, I did not. No. No. It's funny because you mentioned April 8th, and I'm like, I actually remember something about April 8th. And then when you hit, oh, that's, that's what you were talking about. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I love it. That would be great. But they do need to figure out how they're getting home. Yep. Um, as far as uh, so other Big Ten series, of uh, India is going to host Penn State, going to travel to Minnesota. Um, Penn State has a new coach this year. Um, uh, who has who got poached from the ACC? So that will be uh, interesting to see. Uh, there's there are some expectations that Penn State uh, may be on the uprise as soon as the season. I don't know that I quite believe that'll happen that fast, but um, I, I would expect Penn State to improve as a program. Uh, they seem to be making some big investments in baseball. Um, Rutgers will also be coming to the BART. Uh, so that's a that's a, a program that's expected to be in the upper third of the league. Um, Indiana does travel to Purdue. Um, the this is interesting because if you go off the traditional three year scheduling, you would have expected this to be an off year, not playing Purdue, which tells me that it's very likely that uh, the Big Ten has decided to protect the Indiana Purdue series, which is an excellent decision. The rivals should play every year. Yep. So and I, I think that's going to be pushed even more once uh, the league expands with four more teams uh, the following season. They should keep uh, it because, off graduation weekend, though, from each university. Yeah. Yep. Like, because this is ours, right? Yes. Isn't that weekend? And then uh, when they come to us, it shouldn't be theirs. Like, I think that's something you should look, you know, because a lot of people have family that are going to both and it's so close. I just didn't like when I saw that, that it was graduation weekend. But... I guess they can't think of everything, man. We got solar eclipses to figure out. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, travel to to Nebraska. So, with the exception of Purdue, the four series are all going to be uh, the four away series are all going to be some distance from from home. Um, unfortunately. Uh, Good practice for next year. Yeah. Yep. Then there is a good uh, midweek uh, traveling to Louisville to take on the Cardinals. Um, Cardinals got a big question mark around them. They did not make the NCAA tournament last year. Um, there's some expectations that they're going to be better this year, but a lot of that is just based on there's no way Dan McDonald's going to have a team this bad two years in a row, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then... Then uh, we get uh, Tracy Smith and Josh Begley will be taking their Michigan Wolverines back to the building they built, uh, the BART. So uh, May 16th, 17th, and 18th, uh, Michigan and Tracy Smith and Josh Begley will be at the BART. And Begley's a coach now, you said, right? He's not just the... Yes. Uh, yeah, he's a season know, assistant coach ex player now. Ex-player, uh, developer, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. boy. It's a shame. 
he's on the the first base dugout wall, right? Yes, third base. I, third base. Oh, he's third base, not first. Yeah, first base is the yeah. pitchers. <clears throat> that's what it is. Yep. I couldn't remember. The reason the, I know for sure is because that's when I pointed to it when uh, <laughs> when a certain gentleman lost his water. <laughs> Uh, uh, I just remember pointing to that picture. Uh, oh boy! So that's Terrible. the schedule. Um, a couple of the points I wanted to make. Um, one thing, you, the thing you did not hear me say was Indiana playing uh, nationally ranked Iowa. Iowa is not on the schedule this year. Um, I did dive in a bit though and found out that six of the eight teams, Indiana, Iowa, are both playing. So that actually comes down to that if it really does come as everyone predicts, and it never does, <laughs> uh, if it does come down that way, if it ends up being basically a two-team race between Indiana and Iowa, uh, the schedules are actually relatively comparable. They just don't play each other. So the two teams uh, will at least have a comparable schedule at the end of the season. Um, but because they don't play each other, that may help from the perspective, each of them, of not gaining as many losses in the in the league, and it may help pan out what they're talking about, that it, it may come down to those two teams. But it's going to come to how they do against the rest of the, the, rest of the league. Um, the other point I wanted to make was about um, some changes in the NCAA selection. Uh, there's three points I really wanted to make. Number one, the biggest is that uh, Indiana's athletic director, Scott Dolson, is now on the NCAA Baseball Selection Committee. Um, so this will be the first representation from the Big Ten that I've been aware of since I've been following uh, this. I don't know if they, they've had it in the past before I followed it, but um, <clears throat> since we've really been paying attention, this is the first time that the Big Ten has had, uh, and definitely the first time that I can think of that Indiana has had representation on the committee. So that uh, that's that's a huge positive for the league. Uh, to have, and, and you see it all the time. It really does make a difference. Um, it's not technically not supposed to, but it, it does. does. Having someone at the table to to represent the interests of the of the uh, of the Big Ten is going to be huge. Um, there are two additional things that have been added to the uh, to the select to the plate of things the selection committee can look at. Um, one is a metric that is also used in basketball called the KPI, which I'm not going to pronounce out because I don't know how to spell that gentleman's last name. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the KPI is one option. Um, and the way they describe it is it's not going to be – I forgot the exact phrasing. It made no sense. It seemed to be contradictory. But I think the way most people interpret it is it can be helped to be used to break ties. And from my analysis, the KPI is going to favor programs from the conferences like the SEC and the ACC. Um, I don't find the KPI is going to be helpful to IU at all. In fact, IU was 10 spots lower in KPI than they were in RPI last year. Um, that being said, the other change goes the opposite direction, and that is um, expanding the definition of the quads. So if you follow basketball bracketology you you've probably heard about the quads where um how do you do against the teams that are ranked in quad one the upper quad quad two quad three quad four and in baseball that has been defined for several years um as being just straight rpi ranks so if you play against the teams in uh, ranked in the rpi number one to number 50 that's quad one uh, and 51 to 100 is quad two and i think it was you know the next 100 was quad three and then the rest were quad four the tweak that's going to be put in place is going to be designed to match and be more like uh basketball in that it is going to expand the number of teams in each quad uh, if that game is on the road or neutral. So I think, for example, quad one will extend one to 60 for neutral site games, one to 75 for uh, road games. So one example I could see happening, let's say Baylor 
isn't as bad this year as they were last year, but they're still not great. So they end up, let's say, 70th in the RPI. That series could end up being a quad one series being against the number 70 RPI team when last year that would have been a quad two series because they were outside of the top 50. So that's just one example. But there's more likelihood of that to, to play in if you are in, because for example, almost every SEC team ends up in the top 50 just because of the way the strength of schedule works, even if they're bad. I think even, you know, the, you know, the Mississippi State and Ole Miss were in the top 50 last year, even though they were, they finished at the bottom of the league. So that's, um, that RPI tweak isn't going to help the SEC so much, but it may help some Big Ten teams, you know, when you're playing those teams that could be borderline around that uh, 50 to 75 range to improve the quad run rankings. And those are leaned on heavily when it comes to, making those final, you know, if you're, you're on the borderline of whether you're going to host or whether you're going to make the tournament, uh, how you do in quad one is a big deal. So expanding that to include more road games and neutral site games, I think, uh, I think it's helpful. We've got uh, three former Hoosiers uh, who have signed to play overseas You've got Alex Dickerson going to Japan, Kyle Hart going to South Korea, and Sam Travis going down to Mexico. And then uh, another one of the mid-season uh, or mid mid-off-season uh, tidbits we learned, which I am very excited for. I'm sure Josh is as well. Uh, we have Matt Lloyd signing with the St. Louis Cardinals. So that is great to see as a Cards fan. This opportunity, right? I know he was he in Mexico playing before this. Yeah, I know he. I know he played down in Mexico. Yeah, he was he was raking down in Mexico too. He was really doing well. It's, he doesn't give up. He goes down to Mexico, and now he's playing for the Cardinals organization. And then one other uh, pro ball thing that uh, we've seen is it's been announced that. Uh, Schwarber will lead off for the Phillies again in 2024. And actually, there was one more note he had. It was on the next page, which oh, is that uh, yes. uh, Biggs, uh, left-handed pitcher Ben Seiler, has signed with the uh, New England Knockouts of the Independent Frontier League. Um, and as, as Chris likes to point out, he's a big Patriots fan <laughs> for the interview he had, we had with us. Uh, so he'll be right at home there uh, in New England. Very much so. All right, we did have a mailbag question. Um, and the question was, uh, what are your thoughts on the new faces to the pitching staff, uh, incoming freshmen and transfers? Um, and that came from uh, Julianne Schaefer. There's not Ryan rushing. He got in and out of trouble a lot in, in, in his very first outing, but then everything after that, you guys were swinging and missing. He seemed like he really knew what he was doing out there. And, and for such a young arm, I was impressed. I got to say that. Yeah, yeah, I, I that's that's the name that stood out for me too, and I I completely agree with what Chris said there. I, I, it was such a mature inning that he threw yeah. that uh, you're not typical seeing out of a freshman. Yeah, and it, what I'm going to kind of talk about in general with the with with the pitching, and it's both the new arms and 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 the arms coming back is it's clear that the a level of stuff, the stuff has gotten better. Um, there's a lot of arms. Almost every new arm coming in has something special, whether it's high velocity or um, or something really deceptive. Uh, we're seeing out of pretty much every arm that's been added. Um, what we don't know at this point is uh, how much length we're going to get out of a, a, a bunch of different arms. That's that's the thing that's the real tough question that we're really going to have to talk to the coaching staff. And then possibly just wait to see when they actually get out there, you know, who, who can go a long period of time. Um, are we going to be seeing, you know, they, they seem to be really hinting that, you know, that the, the starting pitching is going to be, you know, mostly these returners. So um, a rise door from Foley in particular. Uh, but the question is, are, are they going to be truly starters? Are they just going to be relatively long openers? Um, and then who's going to follow them up? And but uh, from what we're 
from what we're seeing, there's so many arms that we're throwing in the mid nineties that there's going to be a lot of arms they'll be able to go to from these new guys, even if it may only be for an end of time. Uh, yeah, that's right. Jacob Vogel. This is a uh, said so he he came in. Uh, he was part of the the incoming class of twenty two, um, but uh, they read he redshirted, um, and they were basically been working on on up, upping his velocity. And that velocity was up when we saw him in the fall. I yeah, I think we 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 definitely noticed that. And he's got a plus slider as well. So you know, the, and there is there's just the, this this the fall roster was loaded with arms. Um, so we'll have to wait and see which do make the final spring roster, what that construction looks like. And then we'll kind of see who's going to be traveling when they go down. Because obviously the entire roster is not going to travel, but a good portion of the roster will travel uh, to Myrtle Beach. But a lot of these new arms you may see, especially in these early midweeks in February, um, when teams are coming in and, uh, and, that's, and then their they're home, they're home matchups. So I think looking at a lot of these uh, incoming arms will be, we may see a lot of them throw in short stints. For example, the home opener, um, which is going to be uh, on February 20th at 4 p.m., the current time scheduled uh, against Miami of Ohio. Um, and then again uh, on February 27th, that's another Tuesday, 4 p.m. against Purdue Fort Wayne. Um, I think that those are those will be opportunities for us to see a lot of these uh, new arms in real games. Um, and I would not be surprised to see, you know, six, seven arms pitched in a single game in those uh, in those particular matchups. Cass, do you have any uh, overall thoughts you wanted to share with the, the group? Just excited to get going. I, I, I was looking at my calendar. I'm like, oh, wow, that's only three weeks away. When did that happen? Uh, so very excited to get this season going. For me, I definitely want to, you know, look more into the roster and look more into the depth charts and see who's going to be pitching and where's the lineups. But that's not this time, right? I'm very excited about the first practice uh, on Friday. Uh, I'm very uh, happy that we're going to be able to attend that and that, uh, you know, I use having us come in. I really think it's great they're going to be outside. I thought we were for sure going to be in that damn dome doing it. But it looks like the weather will agree. We'll get to see some baseball outside. And The point I wanted to make was, as we're looking at all of these preseason accolades, um, I was actually listening to the uh, – to the first season uh, 11.7 podcast. And uh, they had somebody on there made a really good point, which is that because there are some people like, why do we even do preseason rankings? Cause we just don't know all that much. And everything kind of seems to be a little bit based on last year. Um, and, and that much is true. You know, obviously you do it because we're so excited for the season. Everyone wants to look at this and we want to take, we want we want to see so what are the what did what does this exercise look like it's you look at last year then you look at at who has left and what is what do they know is coming in and and it's tough because in college baseball typically freshmen don't impact teams of that much um there has there have been some major exceptions to that but that's in a general rule of thumb so generally freshmen don't get considered a ton in that Transfers do, but sometimes transfers, it's just a matter of chemistry. Does a transfer, you know, work out well? Indiana has got Nick Mitchell coming in, who is being very highly touted. Um, and and I know we were impressed with him when we saw him in the fall. Um, but, you know, how all of this works out uh, and, you know, how do players like Devin Taylor respond to the huge level of national accolades that are coming through? We're going to want to see all of that. But the point is, we just don't know. We don't know how good this Indiana team is going to be. We don't know how good the rest of the country is going to be in comparison. Um, and a lot of that's just going to have to develop over the course of the season. So um, I don't have a problem with all of the preseason rankings and discussions. Just know that that is just a, a educated guess at this point. And some of those would be very wrong. I mean, last year, I think the defending national champion Ole Miss was ranked in the top five, and they did not make the NCAA tournament last year. So there's 
And, you know, sometimes it's injuries. Sometimes it's just, just something doesn't work for a team. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we know how that goes. It's, it's baseball. <laughs> I almost made was going to make a comment about the 2023 Mets, but you know what? I'm not going to go there. So. <laughs> the gibberish has to wait for a minute so that you can hear me say that. You know what? You're probably right about that. You know, yeah. we did spend quite a bit of money and it didn't work out, but it happens. Oh, we've mentioned a lot of names, uh, a lot of new names, and we haven't mentioned Brandon Burkle on, on the pod. And I want. I, I don't think it would be right to not have people's names on him. You know, people's uh, you know minds on him because yeah. he really impressed at those four ball games, at the plate, at the field. When I'm at the games, especially with a new player, like I remember doing this with Dones when he came, or Kalatha when he came. Like I'll watch the other guys and how they act around this new guy, and 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 it all seemed good to me. It seemed real impressive. I think he slots right in there at second base. Him and Cerny could be quite the combo, Brandon. No, I, I I would completely agree with that. I he was especially on defense. I was really impressed with his defense. Uh, I I think he's going to be uh, he's going to be competing for quite a few Butler awards uh, come this spring. <laughs> All right, as, as I said, we are going to have at least one more podcast. Um, plus, we're definitely going to have uh, content because, uh, like Chris mentioned, uh, we're going to be uh, at practice on Friday, and there will be a media scrum. So we'll have. Uh, mini podcasts that'll be the the results of those interviews um, and then we'll have a much more deep dive uh, uh, spring preview podcast um, before we head off to uh, to the beach to see the Hoosiers in opening week so I want to thank you very much uh, for listening to this big picture preview podcast of Talking Hoosier Baseball for more on Indiana University Baseball hit up iubase.com uh, for Chris Feeney and Cassidy Palmer I'm Carl James, and see you at the beach. <laughs>